Chapter 1. Demographics and Etiology. Summary. Dr. Damra Goff Paris is one of the editors of this publication and co-authored this chapter with Dr. E. Basil Kessler and Dr. Gabriel A. Tony Martin. Dr. Paris is currently an associate professor in counselor education for Empora State University, is the president of ADERA and holds licensure in professional counseling and rehabilitation counseling. She has worked with victims of crime and individuals with co-recurring disorders who have gone through the criminal justice system. Dr. E. Basil Kessler is an assistant professor in counselor education at Emporia State University. He holds license as a professional counselor and is a certified rehabilitation counselor. He began his professional life as a case manager, working with members of the deaf community and as a certified interpreter. He served for 10 years on the Kansas Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, serving in three capacities, interpreter representative, mental health representative, and ex officio for the Kansas Department of Education. Dr. Gabriel A. Tony Martin was a department chair for over 20 years at Lamar University's Deaf Education and Deaf Studies program. He also served as an interpreter for the Southeast Texas Deaf and Hard of Hearing community and a consultant on court cases involving deaf individuals. Dr. Martin unexpectedly passed away during the writing of this chapter. We honor his work by keeping his name as a co-author. In Chapter 1, Demographics and Etiology, Dr. Paris, Dr. Kessler, and Dr. Martin take the reader through an understanding of the deaf community that moves from the medical model to the cultural model. They note that the etiology of a hearing loss which includes information about the types and causes of hearing loss, is not as important as the often overlooked dimensions of the sociolinguistic and cultural elements of being deaf. They remind the reader that there are many dimensions in multiple minority membership. The authors trace a history of public policy that was intended to help federal agencies better understand how those medical conditions that caused hearing loss impacted individuals and society medically, socially, and economically. As much as Paris, Kessler, and Martin understand the obligation government has to address medical conditions that affect the populace, they also illustrate that much more and different information must be obtained and analyzed in order to understand the multiple realities that exist among deaf people. For example, a child who's born deaf and has deaf parents often has a completely different upbringing linguistically, culturally, and educationally than a deaf child whose parents are hearing. Military personnel who experience combat-related traumatic brain injuries with secondary hearing loss have communication needs that differ significantly from those who have Meniere's disease. The authors share that inmates with one disability make up 32% of the federal prison population and 40% of the jail population. Youth with disabilities are disproportionately represented in correctional facilities, and 6.5% of inmates in federal prisons and jails are deaf or have a severe hearing loss. The reader is provided two cases involving deaf adults denied access to sign language interpreters, and whose police interactions and legal cases were exacerbated by a lack of communication of access. In the final third of the chapter, the authors detail that data collection remains problematic as we attempt to understand the lives of deaf people. They identify difficulties in having adequate participation of deaf citizens in national surveys because potential participants are unaware of such surveys or the demographic information is not pertinent to them. For example, the U.S. Census states on their website that questions regarding languages that are spoken fail to include information about sign language users. Additionally, ASL users are counted as those who speak English. The authors stipulate that many surveys are not accessible because they use traditional survey methodologies which overlook materials and information is not translated into visual modes which differ significantly among possible participants. The chapter ends with recommendations on data design and collection across multiple offender-driven agencies including the Department of Justice, federal prisons, and jails. The authors echo researchers' findings to enforce Americans with Disabilities Act self-evaluation plans. 
begin to quantify communication preferences of inmates, identify the use of hearing assistive devices, and prisoner preferences for various technologies, for example, video phones, amplified equipment captions, or signed material. They encourage law enforcement agencies to begin to document types of accommodations based upon disability type, risk factors of citizens through interaction of untrained officers, and time spent training said personnel on issues pertinent to deaf citizens. They urge court systems to collect data on those who need sign language interpreters, certified deaf interpreters, real-time captioning, and assistive listening devices. They advise transitional and community-based services to be proactive in determining how accessible their programs are and the relevance of the community integration services offered.